Good afternoon, and welcome to the Technical Assistance Network for Children's Behavioral Health, Cultural and Linguistic Competence Peer Learning Exchange. The Peer Learning Exchange is a webinar of monthly calls with topics focusing on culture, health equity, and disparities in children's behavioral health. Topics are generated by you, individuals working in or being served by behavioral health organizations and partnering with system of care, states, and communities. The PA Network, as it is known, is the National Training and Technical Assistance Center for Children Behavioral Health for Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, SAMHSA. The topic today is Tools for Implementing Class Standards Number One. My name is Miriam Monsalve Serna, President of the Center for Community Learning in Miami, Florida. The CLC is focused on providing training, technical assistance, research, and program evaluation on issues affecting diverse and traditional underserved communities. As a partner in the PA network, CCL provides technical assistance in the area of cultural and linguistic competence. Our expertise focuses around issues of language assistance, class standards implementation, community capacity building, diversity and equity training, behavioral health literacy, and reducing behavioral health disparities. Today's discussion will be led by Catalina Booth. She is the executive director of the Center for Community Learning. In her role as a member of the TA Network, she, she has foc focused her work on class standards implementation. She has designed material to educate administrators, practitioners, and consumers regarding the history and purpose of the class standards. She has also conducted training in culture and cultural identity and how to implement the class standards. In addition, she has authored or co-authored brief and TAA tools designed to help system of care organizations understand and implement the class standards at the organizational level. This presentation is being recorded. Your lines will be mute right now to help eliminate the background noise. So feel free to use the chat box to type if any question or comment during the presentation. Following our brief presentation, we'll open the lines for further questions and discussions. So without further ado, let's get started. Thank you, Miriam, and welcome, everyone. Um, we have designed today's webinar to give you some practical tools to implement the class standards as you design care plans and deliver services. We hope that at the end of this webinar, you will understand the principal class standards, two, be able to apply a broad-based definition of culture, three, understand how culture affects behavioral health, and four, have new tools to use to deliver culturally and linguistically appropriate services. So what are the class standards? The National Class Standards for Culturally and Linguistically Appropriate Services, commonly called CLASS standards, are, were originally published in 2000 by the Office of Minority Health. They are based on Title VI of the Civil Rights Act and the Presidential Executive Order. According to the Office of Minority Health, the CLASS standards are intended to advance health equity, improve quality, and help eliminate care disparities by providing a blueprint for individuals and health organizations to implement culturally and linguistically appropriate services. In 2010, the Office of Minority Health began an enhancement initiative that concluded in the publication of the Enhanced National Class Standards for Health and Healthcare in 2013. There are 15 class standards that are divided into four categories. The first category is designated as a principal standard, and it is here where we're going to spend our entire webinar. If you're interested in the rest of the class standards, um, please contact one of us at the end. We have done previous webinars that have addressed the, 
the entirety of the class standards, but this one is focusing on the principal class standards. Um, we are focusing on the standards because it is the overarching principle that governs the remaining standards. In essence, the mis it is the mission statement of the class standards. And the class st principal class standards states that the goal of the class standards is to provide effective, equitable, understandable, and respectful quality care and services that are responsive to diverse cultural health beliefs and practices, preferred languages, health literacy, and other communication needs. A few things to note, and I've highlighted the key language in red. Notice that it doesn't simply say diverse, culture, diverse cultures. It doesn't say we should be responsive simply to diverse cultures. Instead, it refers to cultural health beliefs and practice in addition to language, literacy, and communication needs. Well, this term is used, why, why does it use the term diverse cultural health beliefs? Well, because the class standards acknowledge that culture goes beyond race and ethnicity and encompasses much more than that. Before we go on to looking at the definition of culture and cultural identity that the class standards use, I want to have some interaction via the chat box. And I want you in the chat box to list three words that best describe who you are, um, how you identify yourself. For example, if I were asked that question, I would type in the chat box, I am a wife, mother, and runner. Others may identify in different ways. So if you could go ahead and chat in, we can uh, sort of get a feel for how uh, the folks in this group would identify themselves. The chat box is right in the middle, right next to the slides. It says public chat and you can chat in the middle. And I will wait as many of you are typing in. We have Hispanic grandmother, a, theolog a theologian and a uh, Notre Dame alum, wife, mother, baker, wife, mother, therapist, Christian mother and grandmother. And as an Asian mother, white cat lover. And I love the diversity of it because so many of us identify, some of us identify by our ethnic background, our racial background. Many of us don't identify those things that we, we identify by our spiritual or religious background, um, our roles that we play in the family, or our vocation. And um, what, let me turn back to this because, um, before we examine the expanded definition, I wanted to take a look at this because it, it really is fascinating that we all describe ourselves in very different manners. And the reason our descriptions and definitions of ourselves are so varied is because there's a wide range of different characteristics, life experiences, and other factors that shape our identity. The definition of culture applied in the class standards acknowledges this reality, that we are much more than our race and ethnicity. The definition of culture used is built on the understanding from the field of psychology that culture is the system of knowledge, concepts, rules, and practices that people learn and transmit across generations. This framework acknowledges that the purpose of culture is to make meaning of the world around us. With that understanding, the Office of Minority Health set out to revise the class standards starting in 2010, and in 2013, they provided us the, um, the expanded definition of culture. In the document which set out the, the revised class standards, the Office of Minority Health defines culture as you see in the slide here. It is the integrated pattern of thought, communication, actions, customs, beliefs, values, institutions, that are so associated wholly or partially with racial, ethnic, linguistic groups, as well as with religious, spiritual, biological, geographical, or sociological characteristics. In other words, culture is dynamic in nature. There are many different pieces that create each individual's culture. So each person's culture and their culture map or their culture identity is going to look vastly different. Um, and that is what the Office of Minority Health wanted to encompass in how they define culture and how they set up the, the enhanced class standards. Closely tied to this notion of culture is the concept of cultural identity. This means that a person's culture is part of their self-concept and self-perception. We are going to now take a look at a video where we will see how people from cultural identity 
for how people form cultural identities and how culture can and does affect behavioral health. The video, um, these were a group of um, men and women in, um, of different um, races and statuses in life, um, gender identities, who were participants in um, wellness and addiction recovery programs um, sponsored by SAMHSA. And they were given an opportunity to discuss how culture and their cultural identity impacted behavioral health. Um, the woman you first heard, um, she spoke about how um, everyone assumed because of her um, skin tone that she was Hispanic. Um, and so the treatment they were they provided her was that uh, that they would provide for Hispanic. And it happened to be that the medication and the treatment provided was very specific to that population. Um, they never bothered to ask her personally what her background was, and it turned out that she was um, from a Cajun background, and her skin color just appeared to be similar to that of a Latino or Hispanic person. And then um, the man with the long white hair shared his experience of receiving a diagnosis um, of being bipolar and talking um, to his a clinician about that bipolar um, diagnosis. And his clinician didn't realize that the client was um, gender fluid and that his gender fluidity sometimes um, would cause this is what would appear to be dissociation because his, um, the, his female side and his male side would um, sort of fight with each other. His work, he explains it better, and could, but what he explained was that, again, um, the clinician never started a conversation about gender identity and how that might be playing a part into how the symptoms were of his diagnosis were manifesting themselves. And then there was a uh, African-American um, youth who shared that his cultural identity was tied to um, he identified himself as a, his culture was his youth and poverty. That he was a he described himself as a poverty survivor and as a youth, and that that was what really defined him. And he shared about how how much the quality and access to care was affected um, by where he lived and by his economic status, and how much trauma he suffered on a daily basis as he watched so many of his um, friends and community members um, become victims of violence and how that culture, the culture of violence and the culture of poverty affected his behavioral health. Um, and I highly encourage you to, after this is over, to go here um, in their own words because it's very, um, very powerful. Um, the videos, um, I chose them because they clearly illustrate how much culture affects behavioral health behavioral health care. Culture is important to behavioral health care because it influences our relationships. It influences relationships within families. It influences clinician um, and consumer relationships. Um, it affects access and resources to care. Um, as, the, as the young man shared, um, his access to care was vastly different um, than another um, man who uh, talked later in the video whose mom was a um, master's level nurse practitioner who had taught him how to access care while this young African American male who um, was on Medicaid had a much different experience and how that cultural background and that cultural identity um, really defined what services were available to him, how he defined his problems, and how he could access care. And culture is impo important to behavioral health care because it affects how people understand and communicate their symptoms to others. Um, for example, the, the uh, older gentleman with the white hair who identified as gender fluid um, did not communicate his symptoms as I'm hearing voices and I'm having dissociation. His, his, his description was, I'm gender fluid, I have a female side and a male side, and without that understanding and that background, the clinician was not able to truly um, address his, his needs and, and provide a good health care. It's only when that conversation started that they could provide a, a plan of care that, it, that incorporated um, his gender identity. And culture 
uh, is important to uh, behavioral health care because it clarifies how the environment creates barriers or opportunities to access care. In, um, and today, we're going, in the next section, we'll take a brief look at three tools designed to help practitioners provide effective and responsive services that incorporate a person's culture and their cultural identity. Today, we're going to examine three tools. Um, the first tool we're going to examine is the cultural formulation interview from the DSM-5, and it is designed to help clinicians make a cultural assessment. And then we will look at the Health Beliefs Toolkit, which provides questions for an individual assessment of culture as it relates to health beliefs, and then looks beyond the individual to assess the impact of health beliefs at the community and organizational level. And third, uh, I will show you a cultural identity exercise that I found on uh, www.tolerance.org, which is a practical exercise to help open the conversation about culture and cultural identity. It's a tool that could be used in a group or in an individual uh, setting. Let's start with the cultural formulation interview. It is an evidence-based tool created for the American Psychiatric Association and the DSM-5 Cross-Cultural Issues subgroup. It was designed by a multidisciplinary consortium led by Columbia University and the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Its purpose is to provide information regarding a person's culture and cultural identity during the diagnosis and treatment planning. In other words, it's a tool designed to prevent some of the issues the individuals described in the video. For example, uh, wrong assumptions about racial backgrounds, uh, some wrong assumptions about symptoms um, and, gender, and gender identity. Um, the cultural formulation um, interview is divided into four domains. If you would like to, um, you will look at files available for download. You can go ahead and download your copy. It is the one called culturally, uh, DSM-5, the first one. Um, you can go ahead and uh, download that for your use. They will also be available all throughout the webinar, and you can do it at the end. And after we look at this slide, we're going to take a look at the group, and, and I'm going to show you the key parts of it. So the cultural formulation interview, or the CFI as it's commonly known, examines four domains. The first domain is how the individual's cultural background and identity shape their definition of the issue for which they are receiving services or treatment. The second domain is how the individual's cultural background affects their understanding of the cause of their condition, the stressors that affect the condition, and the support they may have in addressing that condition. The third domain is how the background, how their background, the individual's background, influences self-coping, help seeking, and how it might create barriers. And the fourth domain is how their background impacts their current care and service plan. Gary, if you could switch the screen and put it. I just want to guide you through the, the cover page. It just um, gives the link uh, um, and, and the site. Um, and then starts the actual cultural formulation, which is a three-page document. Um, on the left-hand side, it gives um, tips and guides to the interviewer, the practitioner who's asking the questions. And then on the right-hand side, um, it gives instructions um, to give to the individual that you're interviewing and the questions you should ask. The first section um, over here is the cultural definition of the problem. And um, it's a focus on the individual's It's a focus on the individual's um, own way of understanding the problem. And it's a time to ask how individual frames the problem for members um, and also a time how they frame it for themselves, how they framed it to members of their social network, and also how their social network. Um, this is really a good time to help the individual um, and coach them into verbalizing the issue. Um, sometimes they'll just give medical diagnosis or symptoms. But you want to coach them that people often understand their problems in their own way, which may be similar to or different from how doctors prescribe the problem, how would they describe their problem. And then you want to go a step further and ask them that sometimes people have different ways of describing their problem to their family, friends, or others in their community. How would you describe your problem to them? 
you want to do that because you don't want to sit at the surface of just symptoms. You want to go beyond and see how their culture and their cultural identity is affecting how they see the problem. Um, like for example, in Hispanic cultures, there's a variety of different terms that are used for when somebody is uh, suffering anxiety. And if that's how they, um, or depression, and if that's how they're describing it, um, the practitioner needs to be aware of it to truly understand um, where this person is coming from. The second part of this section, uh, the second um, part is the cultural perceptions of cause, context, and support. And it's really looking at the causes, what the individual thinks is the causes. Um, there's, there's vignettes that you can read um, in the Health Beliefs Toolkit, as well as in documentation about the cultural formulation interview, that many times you will get individuals who will explain that their causes um, was, is caused by um, a, a spell that someone put on them, or it's caused by the fact they were exposed to cold wind um, or cold water. Um, and if you don't understand that that's where they're coming from and that's what their cultural background is informing them regarding their condition, um, you're starting in two different starting places. So this is designed for that to become to come out in the open so both the individual and the clinician will have an understanding, comprehensive understanding of where the individual is coming from. Um, the next section looks at stressors and supports, and it's a questions about the social network, caregivers, psychosocial stressors, religion and spirituality, immigration status, refugee status, cultural identity, um, life status. And it's a comprehensive look um, about a person's life context and focusing on their resources, as well as situations that may cause stress, um, because this is affecting um, how they define the problem, how they will be able to seek services, um, or how it's improving or um, making the problem worse. Next, and this is the real meat of the problem, is the role of cultural identity. Um, it's an opportunity for the clinician to ask the individual to reflect on the most salient, most important elements of his or her cultural identity. This would be a good time to use the circles of my multicultural self handout, which we will look at later. Um, so it's really an open conversation about, well, um, the, very much like the exercise that we did, having the individual describe themselves. Well, what are the three most important, you know, what, how would you describe yourself? And why did you pick, for example, uh, grandmother, Hispanic, and therapist? Why are those three things important? Um, and it's an opportunity for the clinician to look at um, immigration-related problems, conflicts across generations, conflicts with gender roles or gender identity. And towards the bottom of this page starts the next section, which is the cultural factors affecting self-coping and past health seeking. And so it begins by looking at self-coping. Um, what are the, looking at the various ways of dealing with a problem. For example, in some cultural backgrounds, they may deal with, um, they may deal with depression by uh, going to a prayer meeting. In other words, in other cultures, they may deal with other mental health issues by seeking um, uh, a, a of going to an alternative medicine practitioner. So this is the opportunity to look at those self-coping um, behaviors. And as, as the next section does the, a similar thing. It looks at past health seeking. How did they get help for this problem? Did they go to medical care? Did they go to mental health treatment? Did they go to their spiritual guide? Did they go to their pastor? Did they go to their grandmother? Um, that helps create the context or help seeking uh, in the past and in the future. The next section examines um, barriers, social barriers to help seeking and getting access to care and problems engaging in previous treatment. For example, the African American youth from the video might say that one of the barriers to care for him is even having transportation to get to the hospital and then the long line to the hospital for patients with Medicaid. So it's, an, an, it's a way to understand the entire context, social context in which that individual lives in. The next um, section, the final section, is cultural factors affecting current health seeking um, and its preferences. For example, some uh, clients may have, because of their cultural background, may not want, um, may not want to have a male therapist. 
some clients, because of their cultural background, may not want to have Saturday appointments because, um, or Friday appointments because those are their holy days. Some may have, um, some youth may, because of their cultural background, their, their, you know, their parents may accompany them, and the youth may not want their parents to accompany them, but that's just their cultural norm. So this is a way to understand um, what preference the person has culturally and what barriers uh, and how they want services provided. Um, and then the last section is an examination of the cl cl clinician-patient relationship. And it's a way to get information about any possible concerns that um, the individual has about the clinic or the clinician-patient uh, clinician relationship. Um, oftentimes, um, a person comes into a, uh, a, an organization for care, and they come from a cultural background where they're taught to not make eye contact, or they're taught to not shake hands, or they're taught not to shake hands. And so there may be things in their background about how they communicate or how they um, go about in seeking care that you need to understand in order to further develop the client-patient relationship. Um, that's a brief look on it, um, but I just want it's a tool that it, it really requires a lot of diving into. And I wanted to introduce it to you as a way of, as a way of showing you that behavioral health care is greatly that culture and cultural identity affects behavioral health care, and that it's something that needs to be addressed carefully and thoroughly as you develop a, a client-patient um, relationship or a service provider relationship with the individual coming for services. If we could go back to the presentation. We're on slide 60. Yeah, okay. So the benefits of using the cultural formulation interview are, one, that it allows the individual to give their own narrative of their behavioral health concerns. Two, it encourages individuals to more fully engage in treatment process. And three, it can be used in all clinical or service encounters. It's not just for ethnic and racial minorities. As you saw, it encompasses a lot more than race and ethnicity. It talks about gender, social status, so it's really something that you can use with all individuals. The second tool we're going to take a look at is um, has some similarities in that it assesses health beliefs and cultural, but it is also a more comprehensive tool in the sense that it examines. Um, the second tool is the health beliefs toolkit. It was designed by Tobin Consulting and the CL Cultural Linguistic Competence Team for the TA Network. It provides behavioral health agencies and their partners a guide on how to examine and incorporate the individual and family's cultural perspective when delivering behavioral health. It's divided into three parts. It has a section on assessing the individual level, and for that section, it has a behavioral health values and beliefs guiding questions. And a majority of the questions are similar um, than those from the cultural formulation um, interview but they're written in a more um, casual or more user-friendly language. Um, and then the next part is the community assessment checklist, which talks, assesses the behavioral health beliefs of the community. And the final section is the organizational policies and procedures as they regard to health beliefs. And, um, just, you have it available for download right now or throughout the presentation or at the end of the presentation. We'll also give you a web link to it. Um, but it is a, a long document, but the reason it's long is because it's organized into sections for each of its, um, the four stages of examining uh, behavioral health beliefs. The stage of understanding language proficiency and multilingualism, then organizational assessments, and then it looks at tools. Um, and conducting evaluations of language assistance. Oh, this is the, just realized. Um, this is the wrong document. <laughs> um, Gary, um, this is the wrong document. We'll have to provide the right document to all the participants. It should have not, it's not, it shouldn't have been the language assistance toolkit, but the behavioral health beliefs toolkit. Um, I just, they look very similar. Um, so I have apologize for that one, but um, somehow those two got confused. Um, 
So we will provide it. Um, we will provide it. This is a valuable document. Feel free to use it. This one deals only with language assistance, and the one we wanted to get to you was the behavioral health um, toolkit. And I do have the um, link to that at the end of the presentation, so you can still have access um, to that. And it's, and the behavioral health police assessment in the in the um, toolkit is designed to help practitioners start a conversation with individuals. Um, can we go back to the presentation, please? And it helps start the conversation with individuals seeking behavioral health care. And it's designed for caseworkers, counselors, intake specialists, or therapists. And it um, asks questions regarding personal beliefs, their knowledge of the illness, their service delivery expectations, their experience with immigration, community beliefs regarding the particular behavioral health condition, family beliefs, spiritual beliefs, and then perceptions of behavioral health too. And we recommend that you use this toolkit in conjunction with the cultural formulation interview, uh, interview to get the most comprehensive view and understanding of the individual's cultural background. The toolkit is a, a tool that we think is very valuable, and the whole toolkit has um, tools as well as explanations on how to use the tools. Um, the value of the CFI of using the cultural formulation is that that is an evidence-based tool. Um, and so we can, um, uh, we, ask, we suggest that you use both of them at the same time. And the Health Police Toolkit is now up for anyone who wants to, um, who wants to download it. But in the um, interest of time and discussion, um, I want to move on. And the last um, tool is a brief, and this is, for, uh, is a, is a uh, exercise that can help you start an individual group conversation about culture. It's an icebreaker into the topic of culture and cultural identity. It's important to remember that you must build rapport and trust before you dive into these deeper issues of culture and cultural identity. Um, can you put up the um, file, please? And this is what it looks like. It's an opportunity for people to um, write the most important aspects of their identity in each of the satellite circles, to put their name in the middle. And for example, I might put um, Christian, mother, runner, um, Hispanic in mine. Um, and then you would continue by asking questions regarding, um, by asking follow-up questions. So this is an exercise that can be used in a group or individual setting. And you would follow it up by asking, what time were you proud to identify yourself with one of the descriptions you used above and a time that was painful. So this is a way to learn how culture and cultural identity can be either an asset or a barrier to care. And then also to name a stereotype associated with one of the groups in which you identify. Again, that helps identify areas of trauma or areas that may become barriers to care. We could go back to the slide. Now, Gary is going to unmute um, the line and um, we want to take this opportunity, we want to hear from you. What tools have you used to assess cultural identity and incorporate culture into service plans? And if you are mute, if you did not call in and you want to share, you can also use the chat box. So, Feel free, now you're unmuted, you can talk or use the chat box if you prefer that too. Thank you for that feedback, Modesta. She said that she liked the exercise and would want to use it as an icebreaker in the training. Um, is the PowerPoint available for download at Sherry? And the answer is um, Gary? Yeah, yeah. I put up a PDF version. Okay. Will it be available uh, while we talk, or will you email it to everyone who was uh, signed up? I'll put it up right now. Okay. Thank you.
So I'll give a few, if someone's typing, so I'm going to give Rebecca a chance to finish typing. If anyone wants to pipe in with some ideas, um, okay, Rebecca says that for assessment she uses the psychosocial. I think she was going to finish that one. <laughs> yes, she's finishing that thought. She uses the psychosocial to assess her cultural identity. That's a good, and, um, and we want to make sure that, you want to make sure that whatever tool you're using doesn't look at a narrow view of culture, but goes beyond race and ethnicity and includes some of the other issues, some of the other aspects that we just, that we talked about today or that you saw on this, um, on these tools. And James is typing in. I'll give James a chance to, uh, to type. The class presentation is now in the files available for download. Gary, can you explain to us how the download works? Because when I just clicked on it, it nothing happened. Sure. So if you <laughs> click on on one of the files down at the bottom, you'll see download file or files. You can click on that, and it's going to download that way. It'll open up in a separate window. I guess my toolbar is in the way. Yeah, or you could have uh, pop-ups blocked. I have a question for Rebecca and James, who both said that they use the psycho for assessment. They use the psychosocial to identify cultural identity. Does that have specific questions like the cultural formulation interview does? I'm not familiar with that one, so I'm just interested in knowing how that one frames those types of questions. The reason we, we recommend the use of one of these tools is because they especially address all aspects of culture as well as how that culture creates health beliefs and how those health beliefs affect the individual's um, health-seeking uh, ability to access treatment, et cetera. And my desk is typing, so I'm going to give her a chance. Everyone's so quiet today, they just want to type. That's a good point. We don't need to be clinicians to assess cultural I identity, and that is correct. Um, the um, the DSM-5 uses the term clinicians because the cultural formulation interview because it's part of the DSM-5. But if you will look at the health police toolkit, that is a toolkit that can be used by anybody, not just clinicians. It can be peer workers, intake workers, uh, intake staff, uh, and anybody in the organization. We have a couple comments coming in via the chat. Come in. All right, come on in, Margie. No, I got this video thing. That just, I re just remember, oh. everyone, just remember you're not muted anymore, so um, you have to do, did, do something did, if you can oh, mute it. So much. You when did on? you find out? I know you put down 12.5, but okay. I submitted 12.5. Here, I think we'll just have to mute everybody again. I found out last night. Okay, last night, but we've... Because it's such a deadly incident. No, no, but the incident is when you were informed. Okay. Trying to give um, a couple of people who are typing an opportunity to finish um, typing, but I'm going to move on and then we'll discuss what comes in. We're almost. Um, Oftentimes, culture seems like it's the, um, oh, Matthew Johnson typed in. For assessment, he uses the psychosocial as well. It, um, I'll admit that I have not gone as in-depth as I should when getting more cultural information. And that, thank you for sharing that. I think, I think that's what we want to, I think that was the lesson for me from watching that video is that um, we check, you know, oftentimes we rely on a, just the psychosocial background forms that we have, and those don't incorporate all the different aspects of culture and cultural identity and health beliefs that these tools do. So we hope that these tools help um, practitioners and help service providers and uh, peer support providers um, the, 
tools to address culture and figure out ways to dive into it and figure out the puzzle pieces. Um, you know, we all need to acknowledge that culture and cultural identity matter and that we have to build a relationship of trust with the person we're serving, with the individual seeking services. And using one of these tools helps break the ice and start an ongoing discussion. Um, as some of the participants have said, you know, that the, the, the circles, the circles of my multicultural identity is a good way to start an icebreaker as part of a trainer training. And then um, you may use the psychosocial background and, um, forms that you have in your organizations, the psychosocial history. And then in later sessions, start to incorporate and ask the questions from the cultural formulation interview and the checklist from the health beliefs toolkit. They're designed to help you get to all the different nooks and crannies where people's identities may be um, not, that they may not be showing um, because they just don't know how to describe, so it helps break that ice. And the goal is to use these tools to incorporate culture and cultural identity um, into the service plan. Um, I think the, the story of the uh, woman who said that you know, it had been several weeks and, or several months of treatment, and all her providers assumed she was Hispanic and were providing specific services to her as if she was Hispanic, and no one asked her. Um, and, and then finally, she shared with them, I'm, I'm not Hispanic. I'm, this, that's not my background. I come from the following background. And what an eye-opening experience that was for her about how people make assumptions. Um, these tools are also helpful for the clinicians to assess their own biases and their own preconceived notions. As you go through these questions, you can't rely on what you assumed. You're getting, you're giving the, you're giving the client, you're giving the participant the voice to ex express their background and express their needs. And we've provided a list of resources. That's the link to the web version of the Health Beliefs Toolkit. Um, the webinar series um, is one put on by SAMHSA, and it, the video clip that we tried to show you is part of that webinar series. It was an example from that webinar series. I highly recommend that series because it is a way of um, um, – and then the cultural activation webinar series, and then the cultural formula formulation resources, and that is a audio blog uh, – sorry, podcast that explains the history and purpose of the cultural formulation interview. We had a question from Modesta that the cultural identity exercise slide of the PowerPoint does not have the information you showed us. No, that's just a screen, uh, a, a picture from the, from the exercise. The exercise can be found in, your, in the files available for download. Um, and it's the one that's called culturally responsive classroom circles of my multicultural, this one right here, um, that's the one, and you can download that one. Do we have, um, that was a great question. Thank you for asking that, Melissa. Does anyone have any more um, questions or anything they want to share, or any points of clarification? And, um, okay, we have a couple of people typing, so I'm going to give those chances a chance to come in. It's a good time if you haven't downloaded those documents um, and you want to download them. It's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we get a certificate of attendance? Um, we don't provide certificates of attendances. Um, if you have a special need for something, um, contact me um, at the top. Um, provide me. I'm going to write your name down and just send me an email and I can send an email confirming that you attended and that it was approximately 60 minutes long if that's what you need for your purposes. But we don't have a formal, uh, you know, continuing education um, uh, certificate. But if you need it for your purposes, internal training purposes, I'm happy to give an e send you an email to verify that. And Dion wants to ask, uh, is it okay to utilize the information shared today as a tool for training staff or do I need permission? You can use it. <laughs> it is, 
we produce this for SAMHSA as a form of uh, technical assistance. If you need help in implementing or have questions or need it tailored, we are happy to work with you on that. So please contact me or any of the other people, um, contact me or Miriam, and we can see if, if you need it tailored, if we can help you tailor um, the presentation to your training needs. So in other words, I, you, there'll be a video, um, a video link will be sent to you, and you can also, that's the PDF, so contact me if you want the actual DECA slide. We have one more person typing. We'll give them a chance. Ms. Um, the chat room is going to stay. I'm waiting for this couple answers to come in. The chat room is going to be re remain open for. Um, five minutes, and I'll receive a transcript of the chat. So if any, if I miss any questions, I'll go back and um, and answer them and find them. Thank you for that feedback, Pam. <laughs> I think everyone's kind of uh, dwindled down. As I said, thank you for joining us. Um, and um, it, if you have any questions, I'm going to put. Uh, I'm. Marissa, please feel free to put your email on the chat box um, so that everyone has that. If anyone has questions regarding the toolkit, the Health Police or the Language Assistance Toolkit, uh, Manisa is one of the main authors of that, and she, along with the folks you have on the screen um, as contacts, can help answer questions about that. I will stay. Um, Y'all are well, uh, okay. So there's a, there's money says email. She can answer questions about the health police toolkit. Um, oh, those of you who provided me email, who provided um, emails, um, Sherry and Matthew, do you need something sent to you, or you just wanted to post that? I'm not sure why everyone's putting their emails up, but that's fine. <laughs> Anyone who registered, we have their emails. Um, if, if you, oh, those are people that need a certificate. Well, we don't have a certificate. I want to make that clear. Um, I, um, oh, oh, those are people who need a certificate. Okay, I will get those. Um, I can't provide a certificate. I don't. We don't have that ability. But I will send an email with your name um, and uh, that you attended um, and that it was 60 minutes long. Mm -hmm. If those that need a certificate keep saying that, um, please go ahead and do that, and um, we will. Um, I will email those to you, um, I, I, or I will send an email with your names on it. Um, and so, Gary, just be sure to send me a chat transcript so that I can have everyone's emails. 